Weird, right? A never-ending tunnel in a men's bathhouse. Now, if you were looking closely, if you were paying attention closely to what was going on in that video, you might have spotted what appears to be a children's stroller, a child stroller, right? Obviously what you would put a toddler, a baby into. Now the question is, what exactly would a stroller be doing in a men's bathhouse? And obviously the first question would be, was that actually what I thought it was? And yes, it indeed was. Here's a close up of the stroller that you probably noticed in that video. Um, what in the world, again, would a baby stroller be doing in a men's bathhouse? Well, we're about to answer that question in just a moment, but another important piece of information that you should consider when putting together the pieces of this very bizarre, uh, likely human trafficking uh, ring that we're looking at here is a mattress that they also came across. Now, this mattress appeared to be child-sized and also it appeared to be soiled. So take a look at this. This is a close-up of a mattress that they actually pulled out of the tunnels when the police came and exposed everything that was going on. That was actually a mattress. This was, I, I talked about this earlier today, but this is an image that is now seared into millions of Americans' minds because it's just shocking to see just how disgusting this, this is, this whole operation is. And, and it is very disgusting because it paints a picture that is quite obvious and quite disturbing, which is, of course, that it seems as though there was some sex abuse going on in these tunnels. Also in worshiping the devil, participated in human sacrifice rituals, rituals and cannibalism. She says her family has been involved in rituals for generations. She is currently in extensive therapy, suffers from multiple personality disorder, meaning she's blocked out many of the terrifying and painful memories of her childhood. Rachel, who is also in disguise to protect her identity. You come from generations of ritualistic uh, abuse? Um, yes, my family has an extensive family tree, and they keep track of who's been involved and who hasn't been involved. And it's gone back to, like, 1700. And so you were... Right. Maybe. I was born into a family that believes in this. And, and this, is a, this is... Does everyone else think it's a nice Jewish family? From the outside, you appear to be a nice Jewish girl. Definitely. And you all are worshiping the devil inside the home? Right. There is other Jewish families across the country. It's not just my own family. Really? And so who knows about it? Lots of people now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I talked to a police detective in the Chicago area, and several of my friends know, and I've spoke publicly before. And so well, when you were brought up in this, this kind of evilness, did you just think it was normal? Um, I've blocked out a lot of the memories I had um, because of my multiple personality disorder. But yes, I mean, it's like if you grow up with something, you think it's normal. Mm -hmm. I always thought... So what kinds of things? You don't have to give us the gory details, but what kinds of things went on in the family? Um, well, there would be rituals in which babies would be sacrificed and you would have to, you know... Who's babies? Um, there were people who um, bred babies in our family. No one would know about it. A lot of people were overweight, so you couldn't tell if they were pregnant or not. Or they would supposedly go away for a while and then come back. So <coughs> you witnessed the sacrifice... Right. Um, when I was very young, I was forced to participate in that, in which I had to sacrifice an infant. And the, the purpose of sacrifice is to what? Is to bring you what? What are you sacrificing for? For power. Uh-huh. Power. And so, were you, you were ever used? Were you ever used yourself? Um, I was molested. I was raped several times. Mm -hmm. um, and what's your mother doing? Um, she's... In all of this? What's her role in all of this? What is... I'm not exactly what her role is. I haven't, you know, recovered all of my memories, but her family was extremely involved. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, she brought me to it. Mm -hmm. Both of my parents brought me to it. And where is she now? Um, she's, um, lives in the Chicago metropolitan area. She's on the Human Relations Commission of the town that she lives in. And she's an upstanding citizen. Nobody would suspect her. Were you
I was called into the office and he said, get on my lap, close the door, get on my lap. He was only eight years old when he says his school principal violated him in the worst possible way. Joel Engelman remembers it vividly. He would caress me, caress my, so my shoulders, and every now and then he would work his way down. This would go on for about 15 minutes. Uh, then he would make me promise that you wouldn't tell your parents about this, would you? It was a rabbi at his school, one of many men Engelman says would sexually abuse him throughout his life, something he claims is commonplace in the ultra-Orthodox community, and the reason he says he left his Jewish roots. Now this New York Hasidic community gears up for the case of Nechemia Weberman, a prominent spiritual counselor who's charged with abusing a young girl. So we're just hoping and praying that this case will prove a point. Rabbi Nuchim Rosenberg has been shunned in his community for speaking out about sexual abuse against children. He says the close nature of the community is a strength, but a curse for those abused. The fact that it's so closely knit has a very big problem of coming out. There are about 250,000 ultra-Orthodox Jews living in Brooklyn, the largest community outside of Israel. They've isolated themselves from outsiders. They have their own schools, police, and court system. That isolation makes it hard for prosecutors. The community is so insular, so um, uh, closed, uh, that the abuse often uh, uh, was had in a yeshiva school or in a synagogue. And within days, the victim would be identified, and then there would be this intimidation and, and uh, harassment and threats. And lead to the abandonment of the case. But District Attorney Heinz's critics say he isn't doing enough and is too close to powerful rabbis. Although he no longer lives in the Hasidic community, Engelman is acutely aware of what happens if you snitch. And as the Hasidic community rallies around Weberman and ostracizes his accuser, victims like Engelman watch closely to see if it's possible for things to change. As long as the environment in the community is that to protect the abuser and to immediately doubt and threaten the victim, uh, this is just going to keep going on. In Brooklyn, New York, Bonnie Ghosh, Associated Press.